Thank you again for joining on Side by Side. Today, uh, the day after St. Patrick's Day, and I hope you had a good day yesterday. Maybe it was just a day off. I think it's always a good day too for those who understand St. Patrick about to think about his life and to reflect on how God called one man who changed one nation by his grace and through that nation changed many nations and is still doing so today. It's amazing what God can do through one obedient life. Well, now we're going to think about another subject today, and that's the question of groaning. Even the word, it has a kind of a a way of expressing something, hasn't it? Let's read together. Yet, verse 18 of Romans 8. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of the future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We, too, wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. Wow, isn't that quite a big theme to think about? But I want to think about the subject of of groaning. I don't know about you, but I kind of think that I find it in myself and I hear it around me in the world. Well, when you ask someone how they're doing, well, I'm doing not too bad. (laughs) I think about that. I'm not too bad. Well, why don't you just say, I'm doing very well, thank you. Or it could be better. Hmm, a bit negative. It could be worse, (laughs) equally. Uh, Not a bad day. I mean, do you hear these comments that we, we use them and they're full of something? It's okay, but it's less than what I would really like. I can't really give you the full, you know, the full positive 100% affirmation. And I'm not really trying to justify our way of responding to our daily life. But there truly is a sense in which maybe this groaning is in some way to be expected. Now, I don't want you and I to go out there speaking like that. And I need to rebuke myself when I do it. But the picture is that here of the labour pains before childbirth, which, as an example, contains the great uh, result and the hope of a new life, that inbuilt anticipation. And so the very creation has suffered as a result of the fall. I mean, surely this very pandemic is an example of what the Bible describes as this bondage to decay in verse 21, this being caught under the subjection of the curse. And every form of life experiences it, the struggle to survive, the violence of competition for dominance and so forth, even in the natural animal world. And so the picture in Romans 8 is of this creation creation stretching up its head as far as possible, trying to catch a glimpse of the good future that God has planned. And this is all referring to that day when Jesus returns, described here in verse 18 as the glory of God. Will, he will reveal to us later, or in verse 19, the revelation of the sons or the children of God. Now, if we're conscious of just how much glory awaits for us, and that being confirmed by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, would we not be like a child waiting for Christmas Day every day, and indeed many times over? And surely this would change any day of our lives into a good day. So how are you doing today? Well, this is another day closer to that day, the day of our salvation. So then not only does creation groan, but secondly, we see here that we also, verse 23 says that we also as believers groan, even though we have the Holy Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. I mean, recalling this picture of labor, and, and we see the groaning with great hope, don't we? That's what should make the difference in us. 
because we already have a taste of the future. The Holy Spirit, he is described there as, as a foretaste of future glory. Think about it. If you have a taste of something amazing, say you've come across a little sample of some food or uh, something nice. For me, it's maybe something like a piece of chocolate or honey or some really good coffee. Wow. And, and you remember that. You know, I can remember perhaps the best coffee I ever got or maybe you know, the best taste of you know, a steak that was just perfect. And you think, ah, I know what that tastes like. Well, or maybe it could even be something like a piece of music or some scene that you've, you've, you've seen a picture of something. And just, it just captures your imagination is the way we use it. Well, while on the one hand, you're really honoured to have had this, does it not also make you long for something more? And it, it also maybe makes you a little bit less satisfied with what you have here and now. So that there's a sense in which we live in this tension, a tension living between now and then. It, I think it well describes the Christian life. Because it talks about as we await or long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. And th this is what we mean when we talk about something that is both now and not yet. The fact that we have this experience, isn't it really evidence of the reality of what has already happened? Yes, you could not have that experience unless you had already something of the grace and power of God in your life. You wouldn't feel that tension. Because a person who's not a Christian has no sense of tension. They only want to hold on to this world for as long as they can. They want to gather as much of this world around them as, as, as quickly and as, you know, as they can. But that, that's not the way of, of the Christian. The Christian now understands, but I, I have tasted, I have sensed the something more that God has prepared for those that love him. And so this is for you and I a kind of a, a reassurance, isn't it, that you live with this tension and that you have been changed and that you have been given this new life and, and so that although you already know your passage to this new future is already safe and it's in your possession and there's no threat of anybody saying, well, it's been overbooked, so I'm sorry, there's no room for you or, or there'll be a delay and you're going, to, you're going to have to wait for an extra whatever, no, or there'll be, it'll be can, can, cancelled altogether. That's never going to happen. Because we have this complete assurance, the death and the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ confirm this to us. So what we might say is this is like a good tension that we live with. This is a good groaning. That's why the groaning of a mother who's <clears throat> waiting to give birth to her child is a good groaning. It's not a bad groaning. It may not be a pleasant groaning. And I have, I have witnessed it myself and I know it's not a pleasant groaning but it leads to something that's so good. But then now there's a third groaning. Not only is the, the groaning of creation and the groaning of our own lives as Christians, but there's the groaning of the Holy Spirit. Yes, verse 28 says, The Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. What this really means is <clears throat> that as Christians still here without the perfection that we will one day have, that we are limited even in our expression, in expressing what we think, what we, what we want to say to God. Sometimes it's because we don't know. Take, for example, the Apostle Paul's thorn in the flesh. I mean, he prayed three times that it would be removed, but that wasn't the right prayer to pray because it was only later he realised, no, God said, you know, my grace is going to be sufficient for you and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So then he said he was able then to pray differently because he came to understand that his life was more purposeful for them while he had this limitation. And William Hendrickson, in his commentary in Romans, talks about a congregation who had, their pastor was very sick. And, I mean, they were praying that he would be cured. But he wasn't cured, and he passed away. And at his funeral, another friend, a minister who was conducting the service, said, you know, you prayed that the Lord would spare him. But maybe the Holy Spirit's unspoken prayer was, take him away for the congregation is leaning all together to heavenly upon him, not upon the Lord. And, you know, this gives us a great peace because while it's not an excuse for us not to pray because the Holy Spirit helps us as we pray, not praying for us always, 
it really does reassure us that, you know, even though we struggle sometimes to know how to pray, he is praying for us as well. So it's okay to groan as a Christian, but don't, let's not complain, for that's not groaning. But the Lord bless you today, and I hope you have a really good day. Well, you will, because it's another day closer to what God has prepared for us all. And the Lord bless you.